Hi everyone, Victoria Oldridge here with Truffold and Mac Woodruff. Mac Woodruff is a photo journalist and you've probably seen him if you've been watching Rogue Trip, which is produced by Nat Geo and streamed on Disney+. Plus. I've watched all six episodes so far, I think it is. That's right. And he's accompanied by his dad, um, famed journalist, also Bob Woodruff. Um, as we all can remember, Bob, um, you know, had a very kind of dire accident in 2006 during the Iraq war. Um, and uh, he's recovered remarkably. And now they get to pair up and have uh, a lot of really interesting adventures together in Rogue Trip. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit first about Rogue Trip because you've traversed, I mean, everything from Colombia and Ethiopia to New Guinea and, and other places. You've hung out with former FARC rebels um, in Colombia and you've rappelled off of mountains and, Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of want to dig in a little bit um, and just learn a little bit more about kind of what your favorite experiences have been so far and what countries, if, are, if there are any favorites and, and what you're learning along the way. Yeah, sure. Well, we hit so many countries. We hit, in order, we did Colombia, Lebanon, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, and Ukraine. So it was all packed into about a four month production window. Mm -hmm two weeks in each place with very little downtime in between. Uh, but like you said, we did, I would like to think almost all the things you can do in, in all of these countries. That's certainly not true, but uh, we tried to get as much done as we possibly could. And all of them, all of them honestly were amazing. I think they all fit the criteria that we were looking for, which were rogue countries. We, we had a tough time kind of defining what that word meant, but we settled on a definition that was, you know, sort of rogue for political reasons or rogue for some sort of environmental disaster that's happened in the past or politically rogue. Mm -hmm. So all of these countries either had one or multiple of those criteria met. Um, I would say my personal favorite is Pakistan. Mm. Pakistan is a place that when I was living in London in 2000 and 2001 um, and 2000, part of 2002, my dad spent a lot of time in Pakistan and so in that episode you can see that we went back to the hotel that he stayed in mm -hmm. right after 9-11 um, during September 11th so uh, during him covering that war and that country just has so much beauty to offer the mountains are some of the biggest mountains in the world uh, the culture is so welcoming and the, the food there I mean I love Indian food and it's pretty similar to Indian food so uh, we enjoyed all of that. But beyond that, just the experience of, of being with my dad and road tripping through the Hindu Kush mountains and, you know, riding on the Korakoram Highway, which is the highest, highest mountain highway in the world, uh, meeting with local people in, in these places that used to be very heavily occupied by the Taliban. Uh, just an experience that I'll never, ever forget. Yeah, definitely the terrain in Pakistan was, I think, something that a lot of people wouldn't imagine. I'm um, yeah. used to seeing the footage that you see in the news, which is completely the opposite of, of the beauty that really um, inhabits the place. And, and also, you know, you guys are going to a lot of places that are typically perceived as completely destitute um, or war-torn. Um, and again, you know, we're not seeing the, the, the beauty aspects and angles of these places. And you guys are illustrating that wonderfully. Yeah. So I, I want to backtrack a little bit to you know, obviously there's journalism in your genes heavily and you've had, you know, a, a first degree influence of that growing up, but you really do have a gift for photography and, and really capturing moments in such a unique way. And so, you know, what, was there a pivotal moment when you picked up a camera and said, this is for me, or did it sort of evolve over time or, or how did that develop? There was a, there was a pivotal pivotal moment for me. I was working at the NBA in Manhattan uh, in their corporate offices, and I was working in their marketing department. And I remember this moment where I was working with a production company, and they were their task was basically to go out and film a commercial for the NBA. And what that entailed was them flying around the United States, getting to hang out with all the best basketball players in the world, and and coming up with the concept. And I was sitting at my desk and I was like, why am I on this side of it instead of doing the creative stuff with, you know, 
the best basketball players in the world or, you know, getting to travel. Instead, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk here in Manhattan day in and day out. And it was that moment where I, I ended up quitting a couple months later and, and diving headfirst into production. So I went to work for a startup and was their photographer, their videographer, their editor, their producer, their, their everything, basically. Typical startup life. Uh, typical startup <laughs> life. Yeah, exactly. So I wore all of the hats, which was the best way to possibly learn. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to learn, you know, the craft of all of those different aspects. And I think I've, I've chosen for myself that photography and cinematography is what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. And um, from there, I, I just started picking up projects. I started shooting a lot on my own. I would shoot where I lived. I would shoot where I would travel to. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I got to travel a lot. So during my you know, during my life, during my lifetime, I, as a child, I grew up in nine different cities uh, by the time I was 12. So that, I think that nomadic lifestyle was bred into me at an early age, whether that's, uh, you know, nature or nurture, I'm not totally sure, probably a large dose of both, um, given my dad and mom's lifestyle. So yeah, and then the photography thing just really started to pick up steam. I I think I've, I got hired for a few projects, which really, you know, gave me that emotional drive to to fully commit to it and then say, hey, this could be an actual career choice for you. And, and it seems like you have talent that uh, other people want to hire you for, which is an important step as a young a young photojournalist, you know, you can start, you can shoot all the, all that you want, but if no one ends up wanting the photos that you shoot, then it's kind of a dead end for you. Mm. Luckily, I had some early encouragement that steered me in the other direction. Um, and where that's evolved to is obviously the show was an incredible opportunity for my dad and I, and, and our relationship is very special going back to that accident that you mentioned in 2006. I think all the time that I get to spend with him now is just something that I don't take for granted at all. I don't know if I ever really did, but especially not now. Mm -hmm. um, and then to go to these countries and be able to photograph them and create a TV show around them just even inspired me more. And it's all that I want to be doing. So uh, I appreciate your compliments about my photography. I think that I have a lot to learn, but I think I've come a long way as well. And I'm very happy with where I am and proud of, of what I've been able to put into my portfolio. And hopefully it just continues to, to flourish. I'm sure it will. Um, so, you know, obviously there are different aspects of journalism. Um, I interview someone or I go to a place, I feel it, I see the pictures, I have that photographed in my mind and I wanna transcribe it into words, into something that's palatable, that someone can digest and feel as though they're there. You're yeah. taking the actual photograph itself. So I wanna peel back the layers a little bit more in terms of when you are behind the lens, you know, what, what triggers where you go, that's it. That's the, the exact angle, because there are millions of them within seconds, right? So I really want to dig into the, you know, the, the psyche of it a little bit in terms of when you're capturing that image, what you're thinking, what you want to convey, and what triggers, hey, this is the time to take that, that shot. Yeah. I think early on in my career, it was, I was more into landscapes. I thought maybe because I think I was actually into landscapes more because it was less intimidating. Mm -hmm. With human subjects, you kind of have to, if you're doing documentary photography, you have to throw yourself into a situation that uh, there's a story to be told and that photo just captures a fraction of that. Or if you're doing, if you're working with human subjects in a more of a stilted way or a, in an actual production, then that involves a level of directing that you have to do. And so early on in my career, I didn't have those chops. And um, I think I was a bit intimidated by that side of it, but initially I was attracted to light. So in landscape, all of it was pretty much dictated by the landscape itself and then how the light was was hitting it and making it look. Um, you can edit a lot of, you can edit some of that with your editing style, but you can't mit, turn a bad photo into a great photo. So in terms of landscape, it's all about patience and timing. Mm -hmm. For documentary, it's certain, certainly a lot about timing as well, but it's also about kind of this fearlessness that I developed, I think, from watching my dad do his thing and you can't be afraid to get closer than maybe you're comfortable getting and you kind of have to just shoot and shoot and shoot and apologize later. You know, my dad always asked, 
I've always said, you know, just do it and then apologize later. And he's gotten a lot of things that more, that other people haven't been able to do because of that. And I think if you take a risk and you take a chance, especially in documentary shooting, it almost always pays off. And so I, I remember this instance in, um, in Ukraine when there was a, a government protest going on and there was like a, there was this red flare that went off in the middle of a crowd. For that, yeah. I, yeah, and I just walked towards it instead of everyone was kind of walking away from it. And I walked towards it, and I ended up getting some of the favorite, my favorite shots that I've ever taken. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. You You've see got these. The bug. You've got yeah, the bug. Yeah, yeah, I certainly have the bug. But you see these moments develop, and in the Ethiopia episode as well, when all of those children are doing backflips and in, into that pile of leaves and. My dad was a full participant. I kind of stood back on the side and yeah. started taking photos of these kids. And it's just an environment for me that I'm not accustomed to. You know, you don't normally see uh, big groups of kids doing stuff like that right on the side of this main road through a town. And then there were all these women there with their tiny infant babies. And um, I just shot and shot and shot. I probably have a thousand photos on my hard drive from that morning. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I just, you can overshoot in, in the age of digital photography, you can overshoot, which is a curse and a blessing. Right. The curse when you get back to your house and you have to go through all these photos, mm -hmm. but it's a blessing because you're able to capture multiple frames of just a second. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, that guy who's doing a backflip through the leaf pile of leaves, uh, the first two frames might, might have been- I have been to say, I was scared for your dad when he did that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh yeah. no, <laughs> let's have Matt do it. No, but he's doing everything you're doing, which is great to see you guys doing pretty much everything together, the parasailing and everything. So, yeah, he's he's not slowing down anytime soon. So, uh, yeah, that's what choose to fill. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you got your own to fill. Yeah, I mean, really, sure. you have the influence, but you're really you're not in anyone's shadow. You're really in your own path, and it's distinct. And that's that. and that's really great. Um, so speaking of you and your dad together, so yeah. obviously since the act you weren't seeing him obviously very often or you know when you could before the 2006 unfortunate accident um and then obviously after that you were kind of given this bizarre yet timely gift of being able to spend a lot more time with him so obviously since 2000 between 2006 and now you've had a good amount of time with him so road trip is not your first stint of having a lot of time with him but this still must be a different type of time in, yes. in going around the world with him. Were you doing much of that before road trip with him or, or no? Well, I think as a family, we traveled a lot, but um, I mean, between 2006 and 2019, when we filmed the show, I was in high school and then I went to college for four years and then I moved to LA and then I moved to New York, uh, then I moved to New York and then Boston and then Sydney. So. Uh, there's a lot of time spent away from my dad too so I, I think that my family has had a priority of traveling together mm -hmm. my dad and i maybe especially too we went to bhutan together which was a very special trip in 2016 i believe but that was actually the first time that my dad and i have taken a long trip just the two of us mm -hmm. and i think that was really the the impetus for wanting the show to get off the ground and and seeing that we had something special there and uh, you know, the time that I spend with him now is is certainly precious. And uh, I, like I said before, I don't take any of it for granted. And he's just a special guy. He's got this tenacity for life that mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people that are 60 have. Um, and he's just, I think that's what makes him so good at his job. He's, he's tireless. He wakes up and he just wants to work. He just wants to tell stories and do what he's been doing for his whole life. And uh, for some reason that just hasn't worn away, no matter how, no matter the fact that he's gone to over a hundred countries and seen more, more of the world than I probably ever will. He's, he's just as hungry as anyone I've ever met uh, or more to see more of it. So I've gotten a lot of that from him. And I think that's why we get along so well is we're bad at being cooped up the last, you know, seven or eight months of this crazy world that we've been living in uh has been tough on on both of us i think more so him honestly since i was in sydney for a good portion of it and then flew home to uh to the only country in the world that i basically could go to <laughs> back home to the united states so yeah, yeah. Um, i've had a little bit of change of scenery but for him he just itching to, to go back and travel internationally again 
So on that note, are you guys going to pick up Road Trip again? Oh, we really hope to. I, I yeah. think that um, it was both a blessing and a curse to come out in the middle of the coronavirus. Yeah. The blessing because a lot of people were hungry for the type of content that this show provides and, you know, somewhat able to live vicariously through my dad and my travels. 100%. And a lot more people at home watching TV. So a little, so good for our ratings probably. Um, but also the other side of that double-edged sword is that it's not a good time to green light a second season of a travel show that involves, you know, seeing big portions of the world. That's right. Uh, if, if we had to factor in two weeks of quarantine into our production schedule, it would essentially double, if not triple our budget. And that's not, you know, not something that we're prepared to do. I don't think so. We'll see. I'm, we're both optimistic, but as of right now, uh, that's that decision's in the hands of of Disney and, and National Geographic. So, what do you think's next for you then in your in your career right now? What do you what is your your goal right now? Um, for me, I've been doing a lot of video shooting, so I'm I'm a DP of sorts, and I've been working for I've in the last month and a half I've worked with Adidas, Patagonia, the North Face, uh, hoping to get on a project with the New York Times soon. So. Oh, great. We'll see. I, I think this journalism thing is, I love being in front of the camera. That was an incredible experience. And um, my dad, in the nicest way possible, I think has pushed me towards maybe doing a little bit more of that because he thought I was good at it. And as much as I appreciate that, I, I do agree that I need to you know, blaze my own path, blaze my own path here. And not that I haven't done that already, but doubling down on that and just being more of a video shooter and a, and a photojournalist, as you said, and keep, keep pursuing those projects. Um, I'm, really inter I'm really interested in continuing with documentary work. So the video side of that is very important to me. And, and that's where I'm pretty much putting all my eggs into that basket now. So yeah, you we'll did, I could see this evolution from the beginning of the series to the, the sixth country, where mm -hmm. in the beginning, you were a little more reticent to kind of just put yourself out there and really let that narrative come out because you're used to doing it through behind a lens, right? Mm -hmm. But as it went on, you just really opened up and the narrative was there and you just were very natural in the way you were illustrating things verbally for, for the audience. So I think you do have that kind of duality that you can tap into and you just have to, it's like anything, it's like a muscle, you just have to keep exercising it, right? So Totally, totally. Yeah, and I think so I think you do see that across the course of the show. And there was that pivotal moment in Lebanon when we went to that rally where I, I, I talked about my reflex to just sort of put my camera lens in between the action and myself. Mm -hmm. Whereas my dad's reflex that he's honed for 20 plus years is to just rush up to the action, start asking people a ton of questions. Yeah. Uh, and that was not my instinct at all, but I'd started to become one. And I think that I'm interested in seeing where that goes for me. And uh, I, don't, I don't think it's impossible to do both. Like I think that there is room in this world now, especially given the, the media budgets that are getting cut left and right, yeah. that if you can kind of be your own one man band, as my dad says, uh, and show up on the scene and, and do a little bit of shooting and do a little bit of self stand up reporting. And uh, there's room for that. And I think that you can see that in the success of YouTubers all over the world and these Twitter journalists that uh, are doing great things and breaking stories that other people aren't able to because they have these cumbersome crews or, or media lo or loopholes to jump through in their, in their companies. Uh, I think there's a, a bad side of that stuff as well, but for the most part, it, it's never been easier to, to tell stories from wherever you live. So I don't feel like I have to do one or the other. And yeah. I think that's, that's a beautiful thing about where we, the state of affairs right now. Or in, in any aspect of life, right? Why choose one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why choose one? And I think in, in, in years past, you had, you sort of had to choose one because people would pigeonhole you. And now I don't think that's the case. I think that you can, you can get hired to be the, sh the video shooter on one project, or you can be hired to be the, in, in front of the camera, stand up journalist talent and the next project, or there's projects where you can do both. Yeah. And, um, that wiggle room is important to me. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what's next for you. I'm really hoping for another round of Rogue Trip. Um, I, I think maybe I just have to go back and watch the first season again. <laughs>
um, especially because I'm a little bit landlocked as well at the moment. Um, and that wanderlust is really kicking in. Um, but anyway, I really appreciate your time. I'm really excited to continue to watch you grow. Um, I think you're going to be, uh, you're going to be a rarity out there and, uh, you're going to be teaching others. So thank appreciate you very and, much. Um, thanks for speaking thanks for with me for the truffled community. And um, to everyone else out there, if you like this content and you want more content, like it each week, uh, subscribe to truffle.com. Thanks, Mac. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.